Hi, good morning, everyone. So uh, this is a tutorial for, uh, named as Modern Natural Language Processing Techniques for Scientific Web Mining Tasks, Data, and Tools. So we have four tutorials. So I basically just give you a very short introduction. So the lead tutor, Sean Wang, is a PhD candidate in computer science, UIUC. Uh, she's mainly working on minimally supervised scientific text mining with applications in biomedicine and chemistry. So our second tutor is Professor Hang Ji. Uh, she is working on natural language processing machine learning, and text mining. Our third tutor is Dr. Hong Wei Wang, and he is currently postdoc researcher in computer science at UISC. His main working interest, research interest is on graph neural networks, knowledge graphs, and the recommendation systems. Uh, I myself is a professor at UISC, uh, I, my major areas are um, data mining, text mining, machine learning, and scientific data mining. Okay. So we will first give you an introduction on why we want to give this tutorial. Okay. So currently we are handling very, very big data. So we call this is a big data age. However, for unstructured big data, the major challenge is we got a small uh, amount of semi-structured or structured data. However, we have a huge amount of unstructured, especially text data. How can we do data mining to mine unstructured uh, data to you know, structured knowledge is a major challenge. So if we look at the, no matter where, especially we see news, social media business, and scientific papers, medical records, we see we got a huge amount of data, but we need to mine it because such data is increasing so huge. It's well beyond human capability to do any you know, annotation or training, okay? So our general picture is, for, un, for unstructured scientific data, like scientific literature, chemical ontology, or any existing databases, we integrate unstructured scientific literature with semi-structured or structured chemical ontology and databases. What we do is we first try to mine their semantics. For example, using hierarchical spherical embedding methods, using ontology construction and enrichment for text embedding and using cross-media structured semantic representation. Then with such mining and machine learning process, we will get sort of structured data or semi-structured data. Especially we can construct graph neural networks using joint embedding, using ontology construction, information extraction, we will get lots of structured data out of the unstructured one. Then we will be able to enrich our multimedia knowledge base and doing multimedia search and summarization. This lecture is mainly covering, covering this process. Okay. So our tutorial basically discussing uh, two major topics. So essentially we are handling challenges in scientific domain, especially for scientific domain, we get a huge natural language text, but we are lacking of spe specialized domain knowledge. We will integrate the domain knowledge using complex sentence structures in scientific writing and doing multimodal representation of scientific knowledge. So our discussion will focus on two topics. One is information extraction with multimodal representation, external knowledge, and complex sentence structures. The other one is on information retrieval at the corpus level, sentence level, 
and a cross-model retrieval. So our tutorial is partitioned into two parts. Part one is scientific information extraction analysis. Part two is on scientific information search and evidence mining. Finally, we will do some summary and future direction discussion. Thank you. So now we'll get into uh, Xian Wang is going to introduce you the first part. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so now let's uh, go to the first part, scientific uh, information extraction. So uh, for the scientific literature, the biggest problem is that there are just too many papers. For example, uh, there will be more than 500,000 papers published on PubMed, uh, which is a biomedical literature database uh, every year. And plus the growing rate of those scientific uh, papers is kind of exponen uh, exponential. For example, um, as the end of uh, CS of June 13th, uh, 2020, there are at least uh, 140,000 papers published about COVID or coronaviruses, uh, which is just uh, one month after the outbreak of this uh, disease. Uh, so we can see that given this uh, rapid uh, rate of publications of scientific papers, uh, especially, especially for some preprints that are without peer reviews, uh, there are many uh, scientific literature results that are kind of uh, very unorganized, and it is hard for human to directly uh, derive much knowledge from it. Uh, so previously, uh, we will usually rely on human experts, uh, for example, the scientists, uh, to read those literatures uh, because they have the domain knowledge and they can do this information extraction more precisely. Uh, however, as we see that uh, currently the human reading ability almost keeps the same across years. So it is very hard for human to keep up with the uh, exponential growing rate of the scientific paper published every year. Um, so our uh, question that um, uh, can we ask uh, say uh, computers or ask uh, our uh, models to automatically do this information extraction from scientific literature uh, so that we can use the rich information extracted to facilitate uh, uh, downstream applications. Um, so we can first look at how the uh, scientists uh, use the scientific literature to help their real world research. For example, uh, the modern chemists will usually uh, read, uh, say, thousands of papers and uh, try to uh, find those, uh, say, hundreds of thousands of possible chemical reactions uh, that are related to their study. And then they will manually examine all those re reactions uh, based uh, not only on the text information, but also on some uh, other uh, information, say, in figures or tables. Uh, to help them manually pick out, uh, say, the top 20 candidates that are most relevant to their specific research interest. Um, so can we uh, automate this whole process? Uh, currently, uh, there is no uh, existing literature search engines that can support these kinds of um, deep and complex analysis and uh, information extraction and uh, retrieval. Uh, and in the NLP domain, there are some shared tasks to cover some of the uh, major challenges, uh, but most of them are focused in the biomedical domain. While in, for science, there are many other domains that lack this kind of uh, shared tasks or resources, uh, for example, chemistry. So yeah, as uh, Dr. Han mentioned, uh, our overall goal here is to convert the unstructured text data into structured knowledge. So in the first part, we will cover some existing uh, work and uh, uh, developed systems uh, for extracting the rich information from text. And in the next part, we will cover like how people can uh, use the knowledge uh, to do multimedia search um, in scientific literature. Um, in terms of uh, extracting information from uh, scientific text, there is some uh, unique challenges specifically in scientific domain. 
first, uh, we can see that some uh, scientific entities can be represented into uh, multimodal formats. For example, for those chemical molecules, they could have those uh, text-based descriptions or natural language uh, definitions and the context. And in addition, they could also have some uh, 2D images or graph structures of the chemical molecules and also some structured properties, such as uh, those numerical properties in the external domain-specific knowledge base. So how can we incorporate all these kinds of uh, different information together to have a better representation of the scientific entities? Uh, and the second, uh, we know that uh, in addition to text, there are also some external knowledge bases uh, that are well-established and well-maintained in the scientific domains. Uh, like uh, biomedicine or chemistry. Um, so how can we further incorporate those external knowledge uh, in the uh, say NLP methods or the text mining analysis uh, to help us do a better information extraction? And the last is that uh, the writing style or the sentence structures uh, in the scientific literature is usually very uh, complex. And sometimes those uh, key relational key entities can be separated far away uh, in a very long sentence. So how can we capture those complex uh, scientific sentence structures uh, and uh, uh, to resolve those problems and to do a better information extraction? Uh, so in the first part, we will um, focus on these three challenges and uh, discuss several solutions that uh, target these special challenges in the scientific domain. So we can first look at uh, uh, the first challenge, how can we leverage different kinds of information uh, to better understand the scientific entities in text. Uh, we can first look at an example here. Uh, so uh, what do you think uh, can be uh, associated with a chemical entity? Uh, we can see like here, this is a long name of a chemical molecule. Uh, so first we'll definitely have this formula like name. And in addition, it can also have some uh, graph structures such as the graph molecule, which is associated with this long chemical name. And also we have uh, many more text information, such as its natural language definition and also some natural language context in the literature where this uh, molecule have appeared. Uh, we can see that for those uh, chemical entities, for example, they are usually uh, uh, kinds of rare terms, which means they do not appear very frequently in text uh, only. Uh, so if we want to uh, better understand those entities, uh, like those chemical molecules, uh, we need to not only leverage the rich text information, but also some additional information. For example, the uh, molecule graphs can be a very good resource. Uh, in addition uh, to those uh, graph structures, there could uh, be many more information that are uh, that exists in the external databases. For example, uh, for the same uh, long molecule, it could also have some uh, properties associated in the PubCam uh, database, uh, like those numerical uh, values, such as exact mass or topological polar surface area. Uh, those are also very important uh, properties of this molecule. And if they can be further incorporated, it will help us better uh, understand um, the meaning or the uh, property or the functions of this molecule. So uh, in this part, uh, in this first challenge, uh, we will introduce two work. The first one is CAMNER, which is a fine-grained chemistry named entity recognition with ontology-guided distance supervision. So this one mainly focuses on the text information and some uh, ontology and the database information associated with those chemical uh, entity names. So here our task is that uh, given an input corpus with all those raw sentences, we want to uh, identify those mentions that are relevant to uh, those chemical entities. And also we want to assign the most appropriate fine-grained name to each entity uh, in the text. So the uh, overall framework of this CAMNER uh, method is that first it will involve some uh, span detection methods to find the entity mentions in the text. Then it will leverage a flexible KB matching method 
uh, to assign some initial uh, candidate types to each mention. After that, uh, they will leverage both the ontological structure of those fungal chemical types and also the local context in the long chemistry sentence uh, to help uh, disambiguate those candidate types and to find the most appropriate one to be assigned uh, uh, for each entity in the sentence. Uh, after the first three steps, uh, people can get a very good and high quality training data automatically without any human annotation. And after that, uh, they can use it to train a sequence labeling model to further do the final prediction. So you can see that uh, uh, in uh, general, this CAMNER framework is uh, a kind of uh, high quality entity, uh, fine grained entity recognition uh, method and that it, it do not involve much human effort for training data annotation. So uh, we can take a closer look at each step. Uh, the first one is entity span detection and the flexible KB matching. So given the input corpus, uh, we can first leverage some chemical freeze chunking tools to extract those candidate spans uh, with high quality. Then we want to assign several candidate types to each mention in the sentence. So the problem here is that um, those chemical entities, especially, they usually have those long and complex naming structures. So if we do a simple string matching, it's likely that we will miss most of the entities in the corpus. So in CAMNER here, uh, they use a TF-IDF based majority voting method, uh, which means that for each long chemical name, uh, it will first be split into several uh, tokens, and they will ask each token to vote for several most uh, uh, possible candidate types and finally do a majority voting. So by this uh, kinds of flexible matching, uh, they will be able to match many long and complex entities that does not exist in the uh, existing knowledge base. Uh, after the initial step of candidate type assignment, uh, people wanted to disambiguate those uh, types to find the ones that are most appropriate for each entity under the certain context. Uh, so here uh, in CAMNER, they leverage this chemistry ontology structure. Um, basically for those fungal chemistry types, uh, those are automatically crawled from Wikipedia. Uh, so they first get all those Wikipedia categories rooted under this chemistry category uh, and use that to form the uh, skeleton of the ontology. Uh, then they further find those um, associated page titles for each category in the Wikipedia to form the dictionary uh, dictionaries for each entity type. Uh, so after these two steps, they will get a very comprehensive and fine-grained chemistry type ontology. And for each uh, type node in it, it will have a rich uh, associated diction entity diction dictionary. They further leverage some uh, external knowledge bases, uh, such as PubCam to enrich those entity dictionaries uh, to facilitate the step of uh, good KB matching. Then uh, after uh, they got this uh, can, uh, ontology structure, and they can use it to guide this multi-type disambiguation. Um, so uh, how can we do this uh, disambiguation? The key idea here is that uh, we assume the entities in the same sentence or paragraph, they usually follow a focused topic. For example, in this sentence, uh, when entity is palladium and it is uh, assigned with two candidate types, catalyst and the transition metal. And if we look at the ontology structure in the chemistry domain, we can see that on the top levels, there are usually some uh, very uh, coarse types that are associated with some uh, large chemistry domains or uh, chemistry topics, such as chemical reaction or chemical elements. And uh, we can see that one of the candidate type catalyst falls under the branch of chemical reaction, while the other falls under the branch of chemical elements. Uh, then how can we know which one is more likely to be correct? Uh, we can further look at the context. Uh, for example, other entities in the same sentence. And we can see here, it got cross coupling and functional groups in the same sentence. And the types of those uh, surrounding entities also falls under the branch of chemical reactions and more specifically under organic reactions. So by looking at the context and also the ontology structure, 
um, we can uh, be more confident to say that this sentence is more likely to be talking about some chemical reactions uh, rather than describing some chemical elements. So uh, by leveraging this uh, two parts of information, we know that a catalyst is more likely to be the correct type for palladium compared to transition metal. And uh, after those uh, three steps, we automatically get a large set of training data and we can use it uh, to train a sequence labeling model to further uh, discover more new entities in the corpus. And uh, some uh, sequence labeling models uh, can be used such as the uh, state-of-art pre-trained language models, uh, like robot in the general domain and uh, Cambert in the chemistry domain. Uh, then we can look at some uh, results uh, from CAMNER. Uh, so in CAMNER, they compared it uh, with some uh, state-of-art supervised NER methods, such as robot and CAMBERTA based methods, uh, and also some state-of-art distantly supervised NER methods, like auto-NER and bound. And uh, we can see that the CAMNER framework is very uh, effective. It achieved uh, about 0.25 absolute F1 score improvement uh, compared with the best performing supervised baseline robot. And if we look at some concrete example sentences in the chemistry literature, we can see that uh, this aerial chloride uh, should be labeled as an uh, alkanol highlight. And if we use a simple notch based matching, say matching those chemistry dictionaries, it's likely that they will match aerial and chlorides as two separate entities, and each with a lot of different candidate types that they cannot automatically uh, disambiguate. Well, with the CAMNER framework, uh, they will be able to recognize aerial chlorides as one entity and assign the correct type of uh, octanol highlight to it. Yeah, so this is uh, the first work uh, called CAMNER, which mainly leveraged the text and ontology structures. Uh, next, uh, Hongwei will introduce like how we go beyond the text to leverage the molecule graph information to learn a better entity representation. Okay, so uh, thanks, Xuan. Uh, so uh, I'm Hongwei. So uh, text is not the uh, only source of information in scientific domains. So going beyond text, uh, in this section, I will introduce another type of data in scientific domains, which is graph. Uh, graph structure data are uh, ubiquitous in scientific domains. So for example, uh, a molecule is a graph where nodes are atoms and edges are uh, covalent bonds. And a protein is also a graph where nodes are amino acids and edges are peptide bonds and hydrogen bonds. And in addition, protein-protein uh, interactions, synthetic routes, uh, program graphs, and syn graphs are all uh, graph structure data. But a natural problem of graph uh, graphs is that uh, graph structures are usually complicated, which requires a tedious feature engineering to extract useful information from graphs. So to address this problem, graph representation learning is proposed uh, recently to uh, automatically learn a short and dense uh, representation vector for each node. And this representation vector is also called embedding. Uh, graph neural networks uh, are a special type of graph uh, representation learning methods. So the key idea of GN is to generate node embeddings based on uh, local neighborhoods. And the intuition of GM model is uh, therefore neighborhood uh, aggregation. So note uh, that for each node, if we uh, first take one step and identify its uh, first order neighbors, and then we keep doing the extension uh, to its second order and third order neighbors, then uh, its neighborhood uh, defines a unique commutation graph. So the basic uh, approach of GM model is to uh, average neighborhood information by applying uh, a neural network. So here we use uh, this HVK to denote the uh, embedding vector of node V in the layer K. So the, uh, uh, and the initial embedding vector HV0 
is initialized as the uh, initial feature of node v, which is the xv here. So in each GN layer, uh, we use this formula to update the node embeddings. So here we first average the neighbor's uh, previous layer embeddings, and then we combine this information of, of node itself and its neighborhood uh, together, followed by a nonlinear activation function. So, okay, so uh, now let's see how uh, graph representation learning can be used in scientific domains. So here I take a molecule representation learning as an example. So how to represent molecules is a fundamental and crucial problem in chemistry. So let's take uh, lactic acid as an example. Uh, chemists usually use uh, this IUPAC nomenclature uh, or molecule formula or structure formula uh, to represent molecules in, in, in chemistry literature. And this uh, space filling model and uh, bone stick model are also uh, two common ways to represent molecules to show their 3D structure. However, uh, such representations are initially designed for human readers rather than computers. So to facilitate machine learning algorithm, understanding and making use of molecules, molecule representation learning is proposed to map molecules into a low dimensional real space and represent them as dense vectors. And these learned vectors of molecules can benefit a wide range of downstream tasks, such as chemical reaction prediction, molecule property prediction, molecule generation, drug discovery, ritual synthesis planning, chemical text mining, and chemical knowledge graph modeling. And existing uh, molecule uh, representation learning methods can basically be classified into two categories. The first is uh, smiles based methods which uh, take small strings of molecules as input and use language models such as brain and transformer as their base models and uh, they output uh, hidden layers as molecule embeddings. So let's take a uh, small transformer as an example. It uses this uh, transformer as its base model which takes a small strings of uh, molecules as input uh, and converts it to an embedding by, uh, by, by this encoder. Uh, which is uh, the the fingerprint, which is the uh, fingerprint here, and then it uh, it reconstructs the the input by by the, uh, this decoder. So here, the, uh, this fingerprint uh, is treated as the uh, molecule embedding, which can be fed into another uh, predictor to output the target value. So examples of small based methods include uh, Mobert, Camberta, Smiles Transformer. Small spurt and, and molecule transformer. And another uh, line of molecule repetition learning methods is that they use uh, graph neural networks to process molecular graphs. So the first step uh, is to propagate messages over the molecule graph. Uh, so in the uh, case iteration, we aggregate the neighborhood information uh, and update the, the embedding for atom i using this uh, GN formula here. And then the second step is to uh, read out the molecule graphing embedding. So after a big K iteration, we use a, a readout function to aggregate all atom embedding and, and return the whole graph embedding. So here this readout function can be uh, like some average or a more uh, sophist uh, sophisticated uh, attention-based method. Uh, however, both small space and GN based methods have their uh, own limitations. So, for small space uh, methods, uh, although language models uh, have great power of learning uh, representation of text, uh, they have difficulty dealing with uh, smiles input because smiles is uh, one D linearization of uh, molecule structure, uh, which makes it hard uh, for language models to learn the, uh, the original structure information of molecules. Uh, simply based on strings. So for example, uh, suppose we have a molecule uh, whose structure and smiles are shown here. So we can see that uh, these two oxygen atoms uh, are close in these small strings, but actually they are far from each other. So this will mislead uh, language models, which uh, rely heavily on the relative position of tokens to provide this uh, self-supervised signal. And for GN-based models, uh, they focus more on designing fresh and delicate GN architectures, 
uh, while ignoring the essence of uh, molecular recognition learning, which is the generalization ability. So actually, we uh, will show that uh, there is no specific gene that performs uh, universally best in all downstream tasks. So this means that uh, new gene architectures cannot essentially improve the quality of molecular embeddings. So now uh, I want to introduce the design of our model. So, uh, uh, so we 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 still we use uh, genes as the uh, molecular encoder. So each atom uh, has an initial feature vector consisting of these uh, four parts: element type, charge, whether the atom is in an aromatic ring, and the count of uh, attached hydrogen atoms, and no uh, edge feature, uh, which is a bound type here, is considered because bound type can be inferred by the features of its associated atoms. So, uh, so uh, let's take this uh, carbon atom in, in a phenol molecule as an example. So, uh, so for this carbon atom, the element type is uh, carbon and the charge is zero. And, and whether this atom is in an aromatic ring is true and the count of attached uh, hydrogen atoms is one. So we then uh, transfer, transform these features into four uh, one hot vectors, each of which uh, corresponds to uh, one feature here. And this is the uh, initial feature of, uh, of atoms. And as we uh, mentioned before, existing genes uh, mainly focus on designing new uh, gene architectures, but ignore the essence of, uh, of recognition learning, which is the generalization ability. So in this work, uh, we propose using chemical reactions to assist learning molecule uh, representations and improve the generalization ability. So a chemical reaction uh, usually represent, uh, so a chemical reaction defines a particular relation, this uh, right arrow between reactant set R and product set P. So a chemical reaction uh, usually represents a closed system where uh, several physical quantities retain the same before and after the reaction, such as uh, mass, energy, and charge. So, uh, so it describes a certain kind of equivalence between its uh, reactions and products in this chemical reaction space. So, uh, so our key idea is to preserve such equivalence in the molecular embedding space. Uh, that is, uh, we hope the sum of the uh, reaction embeddings to be equal to the sum of product, uh, product embeddings for chemical reaction. So let's for, uh, let's see a simple example. So given the reaction of uh, uh, alcohol oxi oxidation here, we hope that uh, this equation can still hold uh, can still hold in in the molecular embedding space, which means that the the embedding of ethanol plus the embedding of oxygen should be equal to the embedding of uh, acid aldehyde here. So this means that uh, we hope to preserve this. Uh, equivalence from uh, from chemical reaction space to the molecular embedding space. Okay, so next uh, I'll introduce how uh, this model is trained. So uh, a straightforward uh, loss function for for this proposed method is to minimize the difference uh, between the sum of product embeddings and the sum of uh, reaction embeddings for all uh, reactions, right? Uh, however, it, does, uh, it doesn't work uh, because the model will learn to output uh, all zero embeddings for all molecules. So here we, uh, we will use a mini-batch-based uh, contrastive uh, learning framework. So for a mini-batch of uh, data B, which consists of a batch of uh, reactions, uh, we first use a gene encoder to process all reactants Ri and all products Pi in this mini-batch which give us this, uh, this HRI uh, and HPI here. Uh, and then uh, for each, and then the, uh, the matched uh, pairs RI, PPI are treated as positive pairs whose embedding difference will be minimized uh, while, the, um, while uh, the unmatched pairs are treated as negative pairs whose uh, embedding difference will be maximized. So, uh, so you can see that uh, these matched pairs are along this diagonal and all the unmatched pairs are off the diagonal. So we are going to increase the, uh, so we are going to uh, decrease the uh, value on the diagonal and we are going to increase the value for uh, 
for all the uh, for all the uh, entries of the diagonal. And to avoid uh, the total loss being uh, dominated by these negative pairs, we use a margin-based loss here. And here, this gamma is a positive uh, hyperparameter. Uh, for the uh, experiments, we use a uh, USPTO dataset, uh, which contains about uh, 400,000 uh, training reactions and 30,000 validation reactions and 40,000 uh, test reactions. So each reaction uh, contains small strings of up to five reactions and exactly one product. So here uh, we give some examples of this uh, USPTO uh, reactions here. So we, we've uh, formulated the task of chemical reaction prediction as a ranking problem. So in the inference stage, uh, given a query uh, reactant set R of a chemical reaction, we treat all products in the test set as a candidate pool C. Uh, we first use the trend model to calculate the, the embedding of the query and the embedding of all the uh, candidates. And then we rank all the candidates based on the uh, based on the uh, l2 distance between uh, between this reactant embedding and uh, hr and all the uh, candidate uh, product embedding hc and then the ranking of the uh, ground truth product can be used to calculate the uh, the the mean repro uh, re reciprocal rank the mean rank and and hit value at uh, 1 3 5 and 10 so here's the result of our proposed uh, model molar, and we use uh, different genes as, as the uh, molecule encoder. So uh, it is clear that uh, all, all these four variants of molar can significantly outperform baseline masters. For example, the MRR improvement of molar tag, or the best baselines, this um, molar FT2 is 14.2%. Uh, so okay, so uh, next, uh, Professor uh, Hanji will continue on slides and introduce uh, challenge two. So Professor Ji, you can take over. Thank you, Hongwei. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the second challenge and the third challenge very briefly. Uh, so the second challenge is that scientists wrote the papers for scientists, so they don't bother to explain many of these terms, abbreviations. For example, in this sentence, you can see all of these uh, entities, they are not defined in this content. So if we use what we normally do in natural language understanding, trying to use the contextualized embedding from the sentence level, it won't be able to capture the meaning of these terms. So our first idea to tackle this challenge is to link these known entities to external human construct database. So this kind of uh, external databases are widely available for many scientific domains, such as chemistry and biomedical domains. So the idea is simply to construct a convolutional neural network so that we can uh, each, uh, each block basically encode the multiple uh, convolutional filters for uh, of different window size in the sentence. And then we can compare the uh, similarity on the character level and also content level with the external entries in the database. So um, why that's good? Because the um, external database usually provide us very powerful property descriptions and definitions for these entities. So for example, this one from the database, we not only know the definition um, describing the properties, we also know the structure information, such as um, their um, functions, their roles usually played in different contexts. So we call this as an actual brain. So it's similar to when human read a scientific paper, when you cannot understand anything, you usually look at it in a dictionary or in the database. So um, I'm just giving some examples. Um, so for example, this FKBP12 can be a protein or can be gene. And an external database will tell us it's more likely to be a protein because it has a lot of interactions with other entities. And these entities are also aligned with the original entities in the sentence. So when our machine learning model reads this sentence, we not only read the initial input text, but also this actual constructed um, graph. 
So we basically merge the initial graph and the uh, actual graph together into the final graph. Also note that uh, external database also includes a lot of properties. So these properties and definition also become additional representation for these entities. So I will dive deeper a little bit to describe how we actually construct these graphs. So for the initial span graph, it's very simple. We just consider all the spans up to a certain length, for example, 10 tokens, and then compute the representation for each candidate. And then we will predict the type of every span and relation between the, uh, each pair jointly. And the prediction results will be used to construct the initial span graph. So usually the initial span graph, it tends to be really noisy. And then once we have that actual brain, uh, the actual uh, graph constructed from external database, we will merge these two, the, the initial one and then the actual one by soft align them using attention mechanism. So basically, if their embedded representations are very similar to each other, we try to align them. And then this, you can think of this as a graph to graph alignment problem. Mm -hmm. And then we can merge these two graphs together and then we can uh, train any uh, NLP systems, information suggestion systems using this kind of um, uh, representation. And I will talk about results later. And the third challenge is that um, sentences tends to be very complex in scientific literature. They are usually more complex than what we normally see in news domain. So here we show some comparison about the distance between a event trigger. So event trigger means the word that usually clearly indicates a event or a relation. So the trigger here usually is the first step we need to identify before we extract other information. But if this trigger is far away from the candidate argument, argument means participant, the entity participating in this event, then usually the sequence to sequence model will completely fail. For example, here, this argument is uh, at the beginning of the sentence and this trigger is almost at the end of the sentence. Um, we compute the average distance between the trigger and argument in news domain and scientific domain. You can see uh, uh, the distance is much wider and um, it can be up to 77 words between these two um, uh, knowledge elements. So this brings additional challenge. So how can we tackle this challenge? Fortunately, a lot of the semantic parsing uh, techniques in natural language processing can be used to uh, scientific domain without any problem because they are not uh, dependent on the news domain. So we decide to go ahead to apply those techniques so that we can get a semantic graph for each sentence. So for example, here initially change this trigger appears at the end. It's far away from CTF, OTF1 and so on. But after we uh, construct this semantic graph using semantic parsing, you can see the CTF and OTF1 and OTF2 all become the neighbors of this uh, trigger word. So this significantly narrow down the scope so that when we do encoding, we can encode the whole graph so that we can gather uh, more, more local neighbors. And uh, when we do decoding, we can do top-down uh, decoding in this graph instead of left to right uh, decoding as we normally do in sequence um, decoding like bean search. So um, combining this idea with the actual brain idea we described, we will have two graphs. Basically one is the semantic parsing graph from the initial sentence. The second one is the extended graph from the external database. So the final graph uh, encoding will look like this in the bottom. Um, so we, for each entity, we know it's sentence content. We use that to initialize representation. And then we have this merged graph to uh, update the representation. And then um, basically the message will be passed across this whole uh, merged graph. So we have the global um, uh, uh, graph coming from the external database. And then we have, have the sentence level um, semantic parsing graph. And then we merge them together. Then message parsing is uh, performed across this merged graph. And then finally, we can train the model um, using this uh, graph encoding. And then you can still take advantage of the sentence level representation because we can always use those contrast embedding to initialize the node representation. Okay, so here we are showing some uh, initial results. So we have um, tried to apply this kind of techniques to different benchmarks. Uh, so here uh, we can see the entity 
and the ratio ingestion performance both got improved compared to uh, SOTA. I think this uh, performance is still the best in this leaderboard. And uh, event ingestion, uh, we first tried on the biometric domain Genia this um, data set, and we can see the performance for um, both adding actual brewing and uh, uh, semantic parsing can help a lot. Um, and then we can look into some examples. So here we can see that the semantic parsing graph significantly improved the performance about identifying the arguments. So for example, initially this link was missing, but since this link appears in the AMR graph, so the model was able to know this is likely to be another participant and added this link into the output. Similarly, the external brain, the actual brain will help us identify this uh, CII as a thing of transcription, just because the additional external database will tell us um, there's a um, uh, uh, role this entity usually play in this kind of event. Um, and here we can also see it not only um, help us improve identification, but also help improve the classification. So you can see the AMR graph, the uh, semantic passing graph, help the model to identify the correct participant uh, for the two binding events in the sentence. And then the external database tells us the, uh, you know, the positive regulation usually happen um, involving uh, these two. Um, the, uh, this entity instead of um, other entities in the original graph. So basically the sentence level and the external uh, knowledge are usually complementary. And uh, as uh, Xian mentioned at the beginning that uh, most of people in the community have been working on biomedical domain. Uh, so there's a very big community called BioNLP. They have been doing great efforts for almost two decades now, but uh, we are still lacking of uh, data sets and resources for the chemistry domain. So we went ahead to construct this chemistry information ingestion benchmark that will include entity ingestion, relation ingestion, event ingestion uh, by experts. So the data set is relatively small compared to the biomedical domain, but it's a good starting point. Uh, similarly, we also tried to construct some benchmark for some specific topic like COVID. Uh, the reason is because the ontology usually looks quite different from the general biomedical domain. We have some special focus on special uh, entities and events. So this is another new benchmark we released uh, um, last year. So um, we also try to apply this to a real applications such as drug repurpose and report generation. So the reason we're doing this is because doctors and scientists usually need to spend a lot of time to try to rank the candidate uh, drugs. So our idea is that let's try to convert the huge amount of scientific literature to multi-model um, knowledge graph as we described in the, um, you know, in Hongwei's talk and what Shen uh, uh, described about fine grained information ingestion and what I talked about the relation event ingestion, putting them together, we can have this multi-model knowledge graph. And why this is useful? Because now, um, even before we do any clinical trials for these drugs, we can then check, for example, what are the potential side effects this drug might cause COVID. So, um, of course, we have not done any experiments on COVID yet, but since COVID belongs to the same category as these diseases, so for these diseases, we already have reported results to show how they are connected with the drug. So from this graph, for example, we might determine maybe we should try the first uh, drug before the second one, just because the second one looks like has a lot more um, side effect and um, a lot more connections with those disease. So um, uh, by looking at this uh, graph, if the doctors and scientists don't trust any of these results, they can always go back to uh, read the original sentence and the, the multimedia knowledge graph we showed because uh, each link and each node here has a detailed evidence in the original literature. Yeah, so that's it for this session. Thank you. And uh, Xian, please take over. Uh, thank you, Hong. So, yes, yeah, so now uh, we can go to the uh, second part, um, the scientific information retrieval. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, as we mentioned that in the first part, uh, we can extract those uh, very rich information with very high quality from all those scientific literature. Uh, then we talk about like uh, how people build some search engines uh, 
upon those scientific literature to facilitate some uh, retrieval or search needs. Uh, for currently, there include some traditional document search uh, methods or engines, uh, but also nowadays scientists have more precise and more complex uh, search uh, needs or those queries, so that it further uh, leads to some uh, recent development of those uh, sentence level information retrieval methods and also some multimodal information retrieval methods. So here uh, in this part, uh, we will basically cover this uh, three kinds of, uh, three lines of methods, the corpus level retrieval, sentence level retrieval, and the multimodal information retrieval. So we can first uh, look at part one, uh, corpus level retrieval, which is the uh, traditional document search. Uh, so here, this PubMed system is the uh, most widely used uh, search engine in the biomedical domain. Uh, this is uh, uh, developed by the NCBI uh, NLP group uh, from NIH, which is led by uh, Dr. Zhi Yonglu. So this is a very uh, com uh, comprehensive search engine that uh, in the back end, they involved many uh, existing uh, searching mechanisms. And, and when people use it, it's uh, very simple. It's like the Google search uh, interface where you can input some queries or topics of your interest. Uh, for example, COVID-19, and you will see in the top results, those are some uh, relevant uh, documents, uh, such as those uh, papers in the PubMed literature knowledge base, and also some associated, uh, uh, say, metadata information. Um, so that is the uh, uh, like uh, very uh, most widely used uh, search engine in PubMed, and uh, cu uh, currently the same group at uh, uh, NIH. They also further developed this PubTator based on the previous uh, PubMed search system, where in addition to returning the full documents and the metadata, they also uh, further gave those uh, biomedical entity annotation results in the full text of the retrieved paper so that it can further facilitate some analysis or reading of the documents for scientists. Um, for example, you can see here, uh, if you search, say, breast cancer in this palpitator, it will return a, uh, some relevant documents. And if you uh, click on each document and go into the full text, you can see all those uh, entity annotation results, uh, which includes about uh, six coarse grain entity types, such as genes, uh, diseases, chemical, mutation, species, and cell lines. Uh, which are the most commonly used uh, coarse grained biomedical types. Uh, behind the palpitator, it is also a, a very uh, comprehensive system uh, with, where it is a combination of several uh, different fully supervised NER methods. Uh, so, yeah, so those two are uh, the very uh, recent or very widely used uh, document level search engines in the biomedical domain. And recently, people are more interested in some more precise information. Say, uh, if we only retrieve those documents, those scientists still need to say read through all those long documents or read through, uh, say, uh, thousands of the retrieved documents in order to get uh, their desired information. Um, however, if we can uh, further go one step uh, deeper, if we can return the precise sentences that are most relevant uh, to their queries, uh, that will um, much uh, better uh, help the scientists in their further steps of literature analysis uh, and the knowledge discovery. So in the second part, uh, we will introduce uh, some recent methods and the systems uh, more focusing on this sentence level information retrieval. Uh, so the first one is called the text presso, which is an uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, one of the very initial uh, kind of efforts in doing this sentence level retrieval. Uh, this is a straightforward keyword based uh, retrieval system. Uh, say given a search keyword like breast cancer, uh, it will automatically find all those relevant documents. Then in each document, it will highlight uh, or list out all those sentences where it contains the keywords breast cancer. Uh, so we can see that uh, 
because it's only based on keyword matching. The results can be uh, kind of noisy and not that uh, correct. Um, however, this is a very uh, good initial try uh, where people uh, start to focus on retrieving the concrete sentences in documents uh, to help uh, people better analyze the retrieval results. A more recent one uh, called LeetSense uh, is uh, aiming for similar sentence retrieval. So this work is also done uh, in the same group uh, from NCBI uh, NLP group uh, hosted in NIH. And uh, this work mainly focuses on say giving a sentence. They want to retrieve the semantically similar sentences from massive uh, corpus. And for example, uh, if we query the sentence like breast cancer, which uh, with HER2 have a higher risk of uh, this CNS uh, metastasis and poor prog uh, nosis diseases. Uh, we can see that uh, the top results will uh, be some sentences uh, where they have very uh, similar meanings or indicates uh, similar information. And also in addition to the sentence, we can see the associated document and also some uh, metadata information. Uh, so behind this uh, lead sense system, uh, it is a combination of the keyword-based match and also uh, the neural sentence embedding models. So they basically uh, combine the keywords and the, the sentence embeddings to help this uh, similar sentence retrieval system. Uh, then in addition to um, putting in those uh, keyword queries or natural language uh, sentence queries uh, for scientists, they may have more specific needs. Uh, basically, their queries can be more structured uh, with more uh, uh, precise information. Uh, so here, the third work is called Spike Court, uh, which is developed by the uh, Allen Institute of AI Scientists. And they want to uh, especially support those structured queries. For example, if people want to see uh, what are some conditions that a virus infection can cause? They can input a query in this kind of uh, structured format, and then uh, by some uh, like a button, backend uh, document and a query analysis, uh, they will construct these kinds of uh, graph structures for both the query and the documents. Uh, then further do some uh, matching and ranking, and uh, they can then return those top uh, candidate sentences where they are not only related to this virus infect infection, but also they can find some concrete conditions in the sentences. Um, for example, in the first one, this PCV2 infection caused severe economic losses uh, because of uh, like increased mortality and reduced the uh, production. So uh, we can see that it will also uh, highlight the key components like this PCV2 uh, infection is virus infection in the query and this severe economic loss are some conditions that is caused uh, by this virus infection. So uh, this is, uh, uh, it also uh, supports some other kinds of uh, structured queries such as sequential queries and other kinds of queries. Uh, and if uh, you're interested, you can uh, go to their website and look at their tutorial. Um, uh, last, uh, there is a very recent evidence manner system, which also uh, based on the sentence level retrieval and it tries to automatically retrieve the textual evidence to support some uh, hypothesis uh, validation. So the input could be some uh, keyword or natural language, uh, or some knowledge triplets where the scientists are interested about or interested to be uh, validated. And then this evidence uh, minor system will be able to retrieve the concrete evidence sentences in the literature where uh, they are um, uh, kind of uh, much or closely relevant to the input query triplets. Um, and uh, uh, in evidence minor, they have compared with some existing sentence level retrieval methods uh, such as text presso and listens, and uh, they see that it can achieve uh, a best performance compared with the existing methods for this automated uh, textual sentence retrieval. So uh, uh, we can take a closer, closer look at uh, evidence manner. Basically, it is a, an open information extraction guided uh, query matching uh, method. So given a query, 
uh, like beta-2 uh, adrenal uh, sector activate uh, tachycardia disease. Uh, we want to find those evidence sentences uh, in, the call, uh, in the documents uh, where it should be a, a, a very relevant evidence sentence for this uh, query knowledge triplet. And uh, uh, as we see that uh, those scientific sentences are usually very complex, and it, was, uh, it will have these complex sentence structures and also um, many uh, for, uh, far separated entities uh, and relations. Um, so here in evidence manner, it will first uh, uh, do entity recognition and a synonym uh, grouping for all those entities in the text. And it also leverage some uh, pattern-based open relation extraction to try to extract those concrete knowledge triplets in embedded embedded in a sentence and uh, further uh, group some synonym relations together. So that whenever we got a, a query triplet, uh, they can do this kinds of um, triplet matching uh, so that if a sentence have more uh, 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 knowledge triplets matched with this query triplet, it's more likely that this sentence should be uh, the relevant evidence uh, to this query. So here we can uh, further look at some, uh, say, uh, cases uh, where evidence manner has been applied in the COVID-19 uh, evidence mining. For example, uh, if the users are interested to see um, what are the evidence supporting UV or ultraviolet can kill SARS-CoV-2, uh, they can input these kinds of uh, query in the system, and uh, we can see all those top results are very relevant uh, to this query, such as whole UV inactivated SARS-CoV, uh, bearing multiple episodes and proteins is a candidate vaccine against this virus. Uh, since uh, in the back end, evidence manner also uh, indexed some of those uh, structured uh, like re relational patterns. So it also supports some uh, structured query search. Uh, in the format of relational patterns. For example, if people want to see what are the uh, coronaviruses that can cause some uh, disease or syndromes, uh, they can input a query in the relation uh, pattern format, like a coronavirus cause disease or syndrome. Uh, and we can see in the top ranked results, there are many related uh, sentences with the concrete information. Uh, for example, these uh, several kinds of coronaviruses can cause mild uh, self-limitating upper respiratory tract infections, uh, which is a uh, related disease or syndrome. Since uh, this evidence manner system is built uh, without and uh, requiring uh, domain uh, expert efforts for training data annotation, and basically based on those distantly supervised uh, anti recognition methods, open relation extraction methods, and also unsupervised the sentence retrieval methods. Uh, it is very easy to uh, adapt this system to different domains. So here is uh, another example of how evidence manner works in the chemistry domain uh, for chemistry uh, literature analysis. Uh, similarly, people can um, input queries like a Suzuki coupling and also want to find their related uh, catalyst. Uh, they can put this kinds of query in the system and uh, they can see that uh, in the top ranked sentences, uh, well, we will find uh, like this uh, Suzuki cross coupling polymerization, uh, which has a highly effective catalyst system uh, with those kinds of things. And also uh, because we have those um, entity types and relational meta patterns indexed in the backend, it also facilitated some uh, say type-based or relation pattern-based search. For example, uh, if we search the type time uh, or the type C temperature, uh, which are some very uh, frequently used uh, say numerical types in the chemistry domain, uh, we will be able to find all those uh, say time entities that are are uh, most uh, frequently discussed in those COVID, uh, in those Suzuki coupling related papers, and also those concrete sentences uh, where this uh, time condition has been discussed. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's uh, basically for the first two parts uh, of document and the sentence level retrieval. Then Heng will talk about the third part uh, of uh, multimodal information retrieval. Okay. Thank you, Xin. 
Yeah, so all the work and most of the work that she has described as using a natural language as query. So it's our you know, traditional information retrieval paradigm. However, the most fascinating thing in the scientific domain is it's always multimodal. So for example, if we want to search for a molecule, you can describe it in natural language sentence. However, maybe the most efficient way is just to draw a graph. Like this is what I'm looking for, and can you return the latest uh, papers? Right. So, um, and, or on the other hand, you can also describe in natural language about a new molecular you have uh, in your mind, but uh, you want to search for the uh, images and also the descriptions uh, for that molecular using your natural language query. So basically, we need to bridge this kind of a two data, different data modalities. So how, could, how to do that? The first general um, idea is just consider this as image, right? Like what we have done a lot of work on multimodal representation in the regular image and the natural language. So for example, you can simply use a cross-model attention to compute the mostly likely aligned uh, subgraph and maybe some phrases in the sentence, if you have lots lots of pairs like this, right? So if you can gather together uh, thousands or tens of thousands of pairs, then maybe we can simply consider this as an alignment problem. So doing that, um, we can do some very basic uh, retrieval. So uh, the performance is okay. So we can see you know, top 10 accuracy is close to 90%, so which is okay. However, this is not what all we want, right? Because using this kind of method, you can easily align some tokens and phrases with some substructure. And in most cases, the association between the token and the substructure makes sense. So these are showing some results. Uh, for those of you who have domain knowledge, you might uh, see all of this makes sense. However, the ultimate goal is really trying to build a connection between these two data modalities. For example, if I know nothing about chemistry, I want to be able to understand what this image or this uh, smile stream means, right? Uh, so if the system can generate a very comprehensive natural language description about this molecule, tells me that you know it has a potential role played in this reaction, or maybe uh, it has such such functions or properties, that would be very, very useful. And on the other hand, if a chemist wants to describe their new ideas, right? Like for example, they are going to replace this function with another function, and then they want to see how the final modified molecule or gen newly generated molecule looks like, then if we can translate their natural language into the molecular structure automatically, that would be great, right? So we want to do the bidirectional translation automatically. So again, this whole idea is not really new because we are doing that very often between regular images and uh, natural language sentence or between a foreign language and English, for example. So um, the molecular images or small strings are significantly different from what we normally see in a regular image. For example, this image, you basically describe what's in this visual scene. And uh, occasionally for some news images, you may want to incorporate some background knowledge, you know, indicating location and so on. But um, molecular structures are not always visually displayable in this graph structure. In often uh, cases, you need to really look into the implicit properties. So, that means we need a huge amount of training data if we want to follow the attention idea just to do alignment. So it's not a very feasible solution. Um, but in spite of the recent great advancement on large scale language model, we decided to take the smile string and consider that as a foreign language. And then let's do pre-training on the different uh, single data modalities. So if, for example, for each smile string, we can try to predict uh, what should be filled in into this blank. And similarly, we can do that for the natural language side. We can predict you know, how likely for this token to appear in this context. <clears throat> and then uh, combining uh, these two pre-training, and then we can align the implicitly which token might be aligned with, with, with which part of the smile stream. So for this, we don't need aligned training data. We only need large scale data in a molecular side and natural language side. And then we can use our limited amount of pairs to fine tune this model. So that's the basic idea. Uh, we were stuck in this uh, training for almost a year 
because I have limited number of GPUs. Uh, so um, using my own GPU, so we were able to finish the RA and the transformer ones. And you can see the performance was bad. <laughs> it's not really good. And then we simply uh, get some help from Google recently so that we are able to use their machines and we are able to train the T5 large and uh, also use the um, uh, two different modalities for pre-training. We call our system as more T5 and you can see the performance is much better than a regular RNN transformer uh, for two uh, directions. So let me show you some quick examples. So this is the first direction, basically taking a natural language input, we are able to generate a new molecule automatically. So for most of these cases, you can see, for example, the first one, the third one, they almost look perfect. So the third one, uh, we missed this uh, two here, but otherwise it's almost perfect. The fourth one is almost perfect. Um, and then the other direction is that take an input molecule, we can generate a description in natural language automatically. Again, you can see IN doesn't really work. It will give you lots and lots of repetitions. Transformer only covers some special tokens, but it's not really looking like a natural language. And the T5 uh, is much better, but uh, it's still lacking of some implicit knowledge. And then using our uh, pre-trained model from two different modalities, we can get very nice results. And uh, in many cases, they almost looking uh, identical to the ground truth. You can see, for example, the third one. Yeah, so that's it for this session. Thank you. Grace Han, please take over. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, so. Uh, let's start our final session. After the final session, we are very welcome to have discussions and questions. So let's start the very final summary session. Okay. So uh, thanks for all the previous uh, presentations, presenters. Professor Hong Ji gave a very exciting example on how our recent work uh, especially her group actually got uh, the new breakthrough um, bridging the molecular structures and the natural language text. So here I'm going to do a little summary. Of course, the summary to a certain extent, uh, there are some ongoing work at UIC, uh, not only in computer science, but also in uh, Department of Chemistry, uh, Chemical Engineering, uh, we work together on this new NSF-funded uh, molecular structure center. In the meantime, uh, in the past, we have a major research center working on big data to knowledge funded by NIH. This is the one we actually working together with UCLA, cardiology, their medical schools on scientific literature mining. Okay, so just give you a simple example of how the sign contrast uh, works. So you probably get some idea. Actually, the computer scientists really can work with domain scientists like uh, medical researchers or chemistry researchers. So here, the story was this. Okay. When we work together with a medical school in UCRA, they actually give us some very challenging tasks. The task is this, okay. They say there are six major heart diseases, okay. For cardiology, they think these six major categories, very, very distinct major categories of six uh, heart problems, okay. And there are many, many proteins. And some protein they know, instead of trying to cure the disease by uh, dealing with symptoms, they dealing with the source. The source is they try to adjust and cure the molecular problem, the, the essentially the protein problem, okay? But they say the literature did a lots of studies. Uh, some actually is experimental on mice, okay? Some on uh, human, but some on other things uh, like uh, from biochemistry point of view, okay? However, the literature is in gigantic amount. In the sense, uh, they ask us, say, go to PubMed. You try to just type uh, cardio, cardiovascular diseases. 
Then you look at how many papers you can get in just the last 20 years. And we tried it, we get 500,000 papers. Okay. So then they say, you take this 500,000 papers, can you distinct what are most important proteins related to each particular disease, but not related to the others? Okay. It's interesting, it's a data mining problem, it's natural language. To some extent, we try to plow through very large, you know, the literature text, try to identify particular proteins, which is more distinctively related or associated with one particular disease, but not to the others. Then we, develop a system, we call this one is comparative text analysis. Okay. And it's a very interesting within a few hours of mining, of course, they're more like a correlation studies, you know, some, you know, embedding things. Okay, we got into like, we list a bunch of the, the proteins related to each disease, okay. To their, to our surprise, they are so excited. Why? Because we are medical science blind. However, the top ones for each disease, we identify those top proteins is exactly they are using it for treatment, for training those uh, problems. That simply says the top number one actually is quite accurate. And we did not know it because we just do the literature you know, the correlation, the comparative analysis. However, they say top two, three, four, five, they really want to identify it. And we did give them all the rankings and then the numbers. They say it's very valuable, okay? Of course, this is not just uh, uh, by accidental. We actually got lots of tools we developed over the years, especially how to do comparative distinctive analysis. Of course, the details, if you like, we actually have this system. If you type a side contrast, you likely you can play with the system, not just for heart disease. It's almost for any kind of disease. You try to find a lot of different correlations. So you probably can see it's pretty interesting from the natural language, text mining, and the web, and many things. Okay. Another thing I probably can tell is about this reaction tracker. This is a recent collaboration with uh, chemistry scientists at UIC and uh, with a new center set up by NSF or AI Chemistry Center. Uh, for us, it's Molecular uh, Maker Institute for MMRI. Okay. So for this one, you probably can see is if you type certain queries, okay, like this. And you want to find the specific, like uh, literature and their related description. Okay, you want to, uh, you can mark them. What are the most relevant things? What are somewhat relevant, somewhat uh, irrelevant, or something? So you probably can see you can have different markers, and retrieve different uh, things related to chemical reactions. Okay, so this chemical chemistry uh, reaction tracker is in progress, but something can be demoed, okay? And another thing you probably can see, especially ongoing and for the future study, uh, Dr. Hong Wei Wang also mentioned about these reaction aware molecular, uh, re uh, mo molecular representation learning. So essentially is instead of thinking you are dealing with uh, Molecular, you're actually doing graph encoding, okay? And then with this embedding encoding, you actually can do lots of downstream tasks. I think uh, Professor Hung Ji just showed you, you actually can do a lot of very exciting ones, of mapping and retrieving. So there are lots of, uh, I think Dr. Hong Wei Wang, uh, his recent iClear paper also shows these kind of reaction, tracking, embedding, and prediction can be done in a very successful way, okay. Another thing, actually, the groups are working together with scientists are using massive data and uh, public knowledge bases, doing phrase mining, entity recognition, relation extraction, then finally constructing these heterogeneous information networks. 
for scientific research, such networks leading to you know, knowledge-based construction and a refinement. Another way uh, we have been working on is working on taxonomy construction. Uh, because for almost any sciences, we already have large amount of uh, data and organized in some kind of taxonomy way. For example, for NIH, we have those MASH terms. And for Amazon, they have a, a, a product categories. And we're not also linking in the taxonomy uh, way. But it, there are two things. For a particular corpus, you may want to change your taxonomy to fit your need. Another thing is, even you have a large taxonomy existing, but new things keep coming, new terms keep generating. How can we maintain and extend our taxonomy in an automatic or semi-automated way? So this is a very exciting domain as well. Uh, another very interesting future direction is working on multi-dimensional text cube construction. Just thinking about for science, okay? If you think about it, you for news or other literature, you can thinking about you have product as one dimension, you have a year as another dimension, you have different companies as a third dimension, you can do multi-dimensional classification of those documents into different cube cells. And then you can do summarization, you can do you know, comparative analysis, many things can be kicked in. And for this, actually there are lots of, uh, our recent work are related to this. Just give you an example. We work with uh, geography, uh, geographers, okay, in the Department of Ge Geography at UIC is they have like land use, water, you know, like a flood and all the natural disasters. They want to study different regions, different time, uh, different factors. They need this multi-dimensional hypercube. Currently, we are uh, working together with them uh, using massive literature to build such a multi-dimensional text cube. For them to do drilling down, to do comparative analysis, you probably can see for hex mining, for the web mining, actually it's very, very important to work together with different disciplines uh, using those information extraction, embedding lots of very exciting tools. So that's just our vision, our thinking. So we are open for uh, discussions and questions. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think we have about eight minutes to go. I think that probably is the right time uh, for anybody who, are, who is interested in raising any questions for the tutors, okay, or for the materials we just covered. Yeah, thanks to all of you who stayed with us. Uh, virtual conference is not fun, uh, so yeah. Um, do you guys have any comments or questions? Yeah, if you uh, you are interested in anything, you, you would like to have discussion, that's also, uh, we welcome you to you know, give us comments and uh, raise any questions for, uh, for the future work. Uh, I think that currently uh, all the team actually have been, uh, we just represent uh, our large team of graduate students, undergrad students, uh, working together with many researchers in scientific domains. Uh, like, just give you an example, like uh, Shen Wang has been working together with uh, UCRA, UC uh, Davis, and also Harvard, quite a few researchers working on this scientific data mining. And, uh, we, as a team, uh, we have been working together with uh, chemistry uh, professors and Professor Hong Ji also working with, uh, have a center working on a very large agriculture center called Agriculture AI Center at UIC funded by uh, NSF as well. So uh, 
I think scientists are actually thinking massive amount of data. It's magic. You know, we can use some computer and AI tools to work it out. And it's quite possible. And that progress with the recent uh, progress on representation learning, natural language processing, uh, data mining, I think things are coming together. So, Hongwei, do you want to show up? <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, maybe does anyone want to introduce yourself um, if you are doing really good work? Uh, have any thoughts on this direction? Yeah, I think we originally thinking about we need about uh, 10 minutes <laughs> for the <laughs> question answering. Uh, I think it's uh, it's nice we finally can finish on time. We uh, we prepare so so much uh, material. Yeah, we have a website. Shen, I'm not sure whether you already posted, but um, yeah, it, uh, everything will be happily available on that website. You, know, you yeah, can see right. the slides and the recorded video, and also um, some pointers to the tools and uh, resources. Yeah. Yeah, in our molecular synthesis lab, we are also aiming for finding some new functions of some new, uh, you know, like molecules uh, coupling reactions so that we can speed up a scientific discovery. Um, personally, I'm very excited because um, the results are not just uh, evaluated based on precision record, you actually can see the product. Uh, for example, some people in the center are trying to find a new flavor or even like a new skincare product. <laughs> so it's a very exciting area. Oh, uh, we finally get one question. <laughs> the, can you discuss the challenge of craft, crafting graphs for NLP? Uh, what do you mean by crafting graphs? You mean the molecular graph generation? Is that, uh, more, is that what you're asking? Okay, um, if, if that's what you're asking. Uh, yeah, so I think the, I'm assuming you're talking about the, what I showed uh, in the final session. So um, I'm assuming you're asking the challenges to generate this kind of graph based on this uh, natural language, right? So the, uh, the main challenge is we are still lacking a good way to capture the implicit knowledge. So for example, if you look at the first sentence, it says, you know, it has a row as a blah, 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 right? And so all of these cannot be really uh, shown explicitly in this molecular structure. So, which means um, the output we generate tends to miss a lot of special properties. So you can see here, this one, um, initially, you know, the, the natural language really does not tell us anything about this this true part, but uh, the ground truth has this. So this needs to be inferred from the input natural language and the generated baseline output uh, using domain knowledge. So we still need to work with the uh, domain experts much more closely to make a further uh, advancement. So the results, if you look at the, just the, you know, the, the blue and the which score, those are checking their overlapped part of the output. So, um, Given natural language, the general molecule actually have about 85% um, blur record, which means 85% of the engrams in the sequence of the smile string overlap with the ground truth. So this is pretty exciting already. But for the remaining 15% errors, we still need to capture the implicit knowledge from the domain. Um, and some of these have uh, certain constraints. Um, so you can see if you look at the this final column here means how many of these are valid, right? So uh, we still have 10% of the results are just not valid molecules. So that means there are some certain constraints that the human know, but the, the machine learning model does not know yet. Yeah, so I, I hope that answered your question. 
Does anyone want to add anything into this? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I think that's uh, one way also have done a lot of uh, things on the how to uh, take molecular structures and work out embedding. And I embedding to some extent can link back to the text. I myself feel from the molecular structure to text is somewhat easier than from the text to molecular structures because that's actually the, the, the gap actually is much bigger. But I think I really uh, got very excited to see Professor Ron D actually can do this, e even partially actually is very excited, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I, I need machines to do this kind of work. I wouldn't be able to do this at your UCLA. So we got stuck for about one year. We're not, not able to make it work. But uh, with the Google's machines, we finally, yeah. So it's a little bit depressing to some extent. Like sometimes you, it's not dependent on the techniques, but rather on the computing resource. So I think that's another challenge for academic people to work on this field. Yeah. But uh, uh, Hongwei's uh, idea is also very brilliant because reactions is a very natural uh, way to compose embeddings, right? Like uh, in in regular NLP domain, if you you know try to compose queen and a king together with man and woman, that kind of composition is approximate the composition. But uh, the chemical reactions is the exact composition. So A plus B, you get a C. That C is an exact product. It's not like uh, the approximate embedding composition. So I think it's a very smart idea that we decide to do the embedding composition condition on these reactions. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. We got uh, one minute over. I think I should thank uh, all the tutors and all the audience, you know, especially for our audience uh, stay and hear the last minute. Okay. Thanks a lot. Just enjoy the conference. Thank you and enjoy your conference.